Good afternoon and welcome to HL7's Da Vinci Community Roundtable. Today's session, CMS's Interoperability Final Rule, Overview, and a Clinical Data Exchange Success Story, How Standardization Improves Value-Based Care uh, Performance. My name is Alex Goss, and it is my pleasure to remind all of us that we engage in these forums under HL7's antitrust policies to ensure appropriate collaboration and information sharing. We are very grateful for your participation in our first Community Roundtable of 2024. Today's session starts the year off with two presentations to advance our collective efforts to improve healthcare decision-making, reduce burden across the healthcare ecosystem, and enhance patient experience and quality of care. First, our federal colleagues will provide an overview of the significant CMS interoperability and prior authorization final rule, also known as 0057. After their presentation, we'll take a few questions and hold those we can't get to until an upcoming community roundtable. As we know, this is just the start of our resources and supports to industry related to their implementation efforts of 0057. We'll then learn from several Providence colleagues about their journey to become the first major health system to implement HL7 Da Vinci Project's Clinical Data Exchange, or CDEX, standard, including its piloting with Primera Blue Cross and the vetting and approval by internal quality teams and external HEDIS auditors. Our presenters today are Lorraine Dew, Senior Policy Advisor from the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, Alex Muddy, Muggy, Chief Health Informatics Officer and the Director of Oberhai um, Health Informatics and Interoperability Group at CMS. We also have Samira Singh, the Director of Population Health Informatics at Providence, and Michael Westover, Vice President of Population Health for Providence. Please use the uh, question function in the Zoom platform throughout today's event to submit your questions. We will be posting the slide recording of today's webinar and all of the slides on DaVinci's video presentation page on Confluence. DaVinci's communication lead, Leslie Amaros, will be posting links in the chat box throughout today's event to assist you in locating that page and other resources you may find of interest. We have muted your lines to aid the recording quality. Please use the question feature to submit your questions as we have disabled the chat feature. We appreciate your survey feedback solicited at the conclusion of the webinar. Our next community roundtable is February 28th. Um, that'll be right around the corner. So uh, beyond our present presenter slides that will be included in, on the Confluence page, we will also be including additional content related to clinical data exchange or CDEX use case and the DaVinci project as a whole for your reference. So without further ado, I would love to ask Alex Muggy to come off mute and also uh, be joined by her teammate Lorraine Dew at the, uh, to help us with today's presentation, uh, providing an overview of the finalized policy to advance interoperability and improving prior authorization processes. Lorraine, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Um, and thank you all for having us here today um, on this one week anniversary of the rule posting in the Federal Register, um, or posting, I guess, on the CMS website and then the Federal Register. Um, I understand that the rule has only been out for a few days, um, and some, some of you may have read it and some of you may not have, but today we want to provide a general overview of the policies that are in the rule and then answer some of your questions. Um, if we don't get to your questions, at the end of the slide there, at the end of the slide deck, there is a slide with resources and an email address to submit additional questions. Hopefully we get to answer several of them on the call today. Um, but if not, there are resources in that email address to follow up. Your questions are very important to us. They actually do help us um, inform uh, additional guidance or FAQs that we get posted um, after the rules usually launch. We try to provide FAQs on, on certain areas where we're either getting questions or anticipate getting questions. So um, please you know, ask whatever you have and, and we will uh, do our best to answer it now or at a later date. And as Alex said, the slides will be made available, so you'll have access to those resources as well as to the um, as, as well as to that email address that I mentioned. 
Um, so some of you may have already heard some of this content as well, but it is worth saying again. Um, and I, I want to mention that when the rule released last week, um, I actually had the great honor to be at Nova Hospital in Fairfax, Virginia with the CMS administrator um, when the rule went live. And we were taking a tour of the hospital and we got a chance to talk to several patients and providers to hear their experiences with prior authorization. And we heard over and over again, some of the challenges associated with prior authorization. And what I kept thinking as we went on this tour and, and heard these stories was about how the policies in this rule can really help to streamline some of those challenges, to automate um, some of the, the pain points around prior authorization and remove some of that burden that the clinicians were describing and some of the frustrations that the patients were feeling as well. So even more so after hearing that feedback, I um, am excited about the policies in this rule. We look forward to implementation and we truly believe that this will help to facilitate um, a more streamlined process to save time for providers so they can put their time back into patient care. Um, so I'm going to turn it to Lorraine, who's going to walk through this, but I'll talk to you again at the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, actually, I'll just use the um, time on, you know, on this slide to, to thank the HL7 uh, Community Roundtable for having us and to, you know, to let you know that we really appreciate the work of this community. We're grateful for all of the volunteers in each of the work groups and particularly those groups that are um, responsible for the implementation guides and the standards that we have included in this uh, final rule. So as Alex said, we're really happy to provide you with an update and overview. I'm assuming that many of you may have participated in the webinar that we did last week, either through our stakeholder call or the Weedy call or the Massachusetts call, uh, but you can never hear about these policies too much. Um, we certainly can't really get enough about talking about them either. Um, but um, also, you know, the refinement and development of these policies is really a testament to the engagement of the stakeholders and people involved in this. And we really could not have done it uh, without everyone. So, yeah, you can actually move to uh, the slide after this one, which is um, we just are talking about the overview. And as we've said, we, you know, on the 17th, we announced that we're publishing this rule. It'll be official in the Federal Register in a couple of weeks um, so that you'll be able to see it and download it in the official form. Um, but it really does demonstrate our commitment, um, the administrator's commitment, the secretary's commitment to increasing efficiency so that um, patients, providers, payers, everyone can have a better way of dealing with um, health information. That's really been our goal. And I think we usually try and say, uh, the right data to the right person at the right time. And Alex Goss, you'll remember that we talked about having the right standards for the right purpose at the right time. And this is kind of an ongoing continuation of that mantra. Um, and the, you know, we, in this rule, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about in a minute, the provisions, the impacted payers and the impacted providers that'll be engaged in this and the, and the dates. And what's important uh, as we talk about them is that the impacted payers are going to be uh, implementing the policies, what we call operational policies by January of 2026. And we got a lot of feedback about these um, API policies and needing more time to really implement and test those. And so we uh, made a modification from the proposed rule that those will be implemented by January of 2027. Um, so there's some nuances in there. Are you flipping slides? <laughs> that's the slide we want to be on. Um, so you can my move. Apologies, Lorraine. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, but the um, ultimately, you know, the intent of both of these was starting in 2026 and then moving to 2027 for the APIs is really to improve and streamline the whole, um, the processes and moving industry to electronic prior authorization. And now if you can go to the next slide, I'll give an overview of the final rule. So you should be on um, these provisions. And I'm gonna give a summary in the subsequent slides, which you may have seen, but um, so the provisions, um, as you will see in a moment, are for um, changes to the patient access API, which you already will know about from the final rule that we had from May, 2020. And then some new APIs for provider access, payer to payer, and then of course, 
the prior authorization, and then improvements to the general overall process, which you know better than, than we perhaps, of where those pain points were. So I'll talk a little bit about those. And then because we also heard that, you, that it needs to be on both sides of the equation with the payer and the provider, the prior authorization measures for promoting interoperability performance category and Medicare promoting interoperability program. And then who is impacted is, as I said, on the payer side and the provider side is Medicare Advantage, state Medicaid and CHIP fee-for-service programs, Medicaid managed care and CHIP managed care entities, and the qualified health plans on the fee-for-service, the federally facilitated exchanges. Um, and then I've explained the impacted providers so that we can have a 360 exchange of this information. And now we'll go to the first um, provision. You can go to the next slide, Alex. So for the pay, oh, you so you have slightly different slides. Um, you can go to the next slide. Actually, so I'll go through because I'm trying to take up less time to make sure that we get through these. Um, in the the first um, part of the policy is the patient access API, which, as I said, was included in the May 2020 rule. But we have some new requirements for this beginning for the upper, for the API provision that there's new data requirements that impacted payers will be including certain additional information in the APIs that are requested. Um, and that would be including patients authorization request information and decisions. Now, one thing I didn't say at the beginning of this that is very important is that in, in our policies for this rule, we excluded drugs and we provided a, a description of what drugs that we were excluding. We did, however, get a lot of comments about how important prior authorization is for drugs. And we are looking into opportunities for how we might address um, those comments and how we might have drugs included in prior authorization um, policies in the future. But in this rule, drugs are excluded from the provisions. It doesn't mean that a payer couldn't include information about drugs, but they are specifically excluded in this. And we know we'll get a lot of questions about that. And we already have begun to get some. Um, but but so all the APIs just um, put add on to the end of the statement, excluding drugs. So for the patient access API, prior authorization requests and decision information is to be added to that API when patients request that, that data. But then in order to understand whether or not <clears throat> this policy is effective, there are API use metrics that the payers are required to submit to CMS beginning in 2026. And this is so we can understand the effectiveness of the policy, but also the payers can understand um, how effective their educational strategies um, have been. So now you can go to the next slide. And this one is, I think you're going backwards. Um, you should go to the provider access API. That's where I'm, where I'm at. It yep. may have taken a second. I'm sorry for jumping around. No, that's okay. Um, so in this policy, we this is a new access API, and this is to enable the exchange of information from a payer uh, to a provider at the at the provider's request, so that providers have additional information about their patients with whom they have a relationship. But in this case. Um, and they have to make available information, claims data, encounter data, but it excludes provider remittances and enroll the cost sharing information to protect that information. Um, and there also is a requirement to have an attribution process so you can demonstrate that you have, that that provider has a relationship with that patient so that there is an, a demonstrated treatment relationship. And in this policy in particular, there's also an opt out um, so that a patient can have a process to opt out of having their data sent to that provider should they choose to do that. Uh, and again, we've got you know back sheets on some of this and we'll provide be providing some additional information on this. And then the next slide, if you'll go to that, um, it is a description of the payer to payer API, which also begins in January 2027. 20, and this is what um, replaces the payer-to-payer -payer policy that was in the original May 2020 
final rule because we had, as, as many of you know, a lot of feedback from, into, from the payers saying it was not going to be feasible without a standard. This provides a standard. And, we'll, and we have slides at the end that describe the standards where uh, now there's an API and data requirements that payers will exchange information from a payer to payer when an individual switches payers so that those the next payer will have information about that individual and can do some care management and there'll be more of a longitudinal record. Um, and it has to be done within a week after the start of new coverage. Um, and then there are also policies for concurrent coverage data exchange. So if an individual has dual coverage with two payers, that those payers would also exchange that information on a quarterly basis once the initial exchange has been made. And now you can go to the next slide. And the payer to payer APIs. We also want to make sure that that there was some information shared uh, with from as well as with patients to understand what the benefit was of having their information shared. That this is something that we heard a lot from commenters about information that would be needed to help people engage with these APIs and understand why they might want to share their information with the provider. And with respect to the payer to payer API, really having materials that would be understandable so that an individual could, could opt in or to that data exchange and understand why they were doing that and what the advantages were. We also got comments about, well, can you help us understand what kind of content should be in those materials? And we will be working with our stakeholders on trying to understand what the best type of guidance would be that we can help provide so that the material will be not necessarily identical, but consistent to be able to provide that information when the time comes for these to be implemented in 2027. And you can go to the next slide. I have a timer on, that's why I'm being conscientious about it. Uh, and the next slide um, is our prior authorization API. This again is um, required for implementation in Jan by January of 2027. And this is you, all, all of these, and we'll get to that slide, are using the implementation guides and standards from HL7. Um, but this is to develop and implement an API that's going to identify whether a, a coverage item or service requires prior authorization, what the documentation requirements are, and then provides a request and a response um, to the provider. And so this is why I think people are excited about it is that it standardizes the way the information is requested, that what the requirements are and how that information goes back. In the original proposed rule and in the uh, final rule, we had said that in addition, because there is an X12 standard that must also be used at some point in the exchange because it's a mandatory HIPAA standard. Um, Michael Semino from the National Standards Group is not here with us today, nor typically he would also be providing this information, but um, HHS is providing enforcement discretion so that when an all fire API is can be used, if the X12 standard is not used, um, that will be permissible and it will not be um, non-compliant with the requirements under HIPAA. And additional information is going to be provided um, shortly from the, from the National Standards Group when that becomes available. And if you have questions, we will provide you with their email address. And if you go to the next slide, um, in addition to the API, there are some opportunities for improving the processes, because what we also have heard for many, many years is that it's not just the electronic prior authorization piece, it's also the timeliness of that decision and providing information about what to do with the information that's provided back. So we have made improvements in the decision timeframes for all the payers other than the QHPs based on their statutory authority. So urgent, um, request must be a decision must be provided in 72 hours and standard requests within seven calendar days and ex, um, and then when a denial is made um, a specific clear actionable reason must be provided with that denial and in our rule we say 
regardless of how the prior authorization request is submitted, a, a specific reason for that denial has to be provided back to the provider. That policy goes into effect in January of 2026. And then added onto that are metrics that are required for the payers to be posted on their websites about how they're doing with prior authorization. And the reason we put this in for 2026 is because prior authorization is already an existing activity. And so data can be provided now and then monitored over the course of time. So while it may change also after 2027 when the APIs are in effect, there's still opportunities for improvement with the decision timeframes and providing a specific reason for denial. You can go to the next slide. As we said earlier, um, part of the feedback we had received um, before was that if we don't have the um, prior authorization requirement on both the provider side and the payer side, it may not be as effective. And so what we did in this final rule is we also have um, a requirement for the electronic prior authorization measure as a, a attestation, a yes, no attestation for the providers using EHR technology to communicate with the API. And this is for the participating providers in the um, MIPS programs and in the promoting interoperability program. The scoring will be um, created later, but this will at least provide an incentive for providers to use the APIs that are provided by the payers. And so there'll be additional information on this as well, but we feel like this incentive is going to help both sides of the uh, communication um, ensure that this gets implemented both by the EHRs as well as the payer APIs. And you can move to the next slide. And this is obviously important for the Da Vinci community. These are the interoperability standards that we have for the APIs. These are these technical standards that we've made um, clarification language for the standards that we are both um, adopting and those that we are recommending. So we have certain standards that we are um, requiring to build the APIs and then other implementation guides that we are recommending because they are continuing to be tested and developed. And in our uh, presentations and in our, our um, uh, in our guidance materials, we're showing a chart um, that indicates which APIs use which standards and which APIs you we recommend use certain implementation guides. And I think it's demonstrated best on the charts. And again, many of you may have seen these, but if you go to the next slide, it shows you the required um, APIs. So if you look for the patient access, you know, going across the board, which standards are actually required to develop and implement each of the um, APIs that are in our rule, and then you can follow along and get more information from our colleagues at HL7 and the Da Vinci Group. Um, and they'll be providing additional education and information on these. Um, and so I'm not gonna walk through what each of these standards are, but this is a very good reference if you want to get this out to other individuals. And then on the next slide, if you'll go to that, these are the recommended implementation guides by each API. Now we, you know, we talked a lot about whether something is required or if it's recommended, and, and we may consider adopting these as required in the future, but we think it's really important that we continue on this path of testing these, having them at co these connectathons, understanding what how else they may be developed, because while we believe in them very strongly, we know that they're we want to allow maximum flexibility in their use and get have the work groups get additional feedback on what else may need to be developed to have them have be the best APIs that can be done. So I'm just letting you digest for a moment. And then on my last um, two slides um, for the resources, thank you for moving that forward, is these are the links. And as I've said, these slides are gonna be passed out. Uh, they'll be distributed. They're all, their information is on our website. Um, there's a fact sheet, the final rule. There's also links to the technical standards and other implementation support. And so you will have all of these. And then on the very last slide is our email box, um, ad email address. 
and you can send questions there. We will respond to them. And that we'll be working on the development of frequently asked questions mm -hmm. for purposes of having people have a different, you know, the ability to have additional information for that. And those are the end of my slides and I beat my time by a little bit. Well, thank you, Lorraine, so very much. I think I'm going to ask uh, Jocelyn Keegan if she wants to pose any questions and uh, if Alex Movie wants to come back off of uh, mute to participate in it, that would be great. Cause... Okay, great. So I think the um, first question that I would tackle, because I think it's easy, and I'm, I'm going to share with folks, we definitely got more questions that we're going to be able to answer today and questions that we feel like the... Um, that we won't get to today, we'll pull forward into further conversations. You know, as Alex said at the beginning of the call, this is really the beginning of a conversation as we move into implement mo mode to support um, these regulations. So um, we'll carry information forward and we'll share it with the CMS team directly um, if we don't get to your question today. I think the first is that there's a question about um, whether or not um, uh, Da Vinci or, um, or the CMS team is considering uh, concurrent review uh, workflows um, under um, this um, using these guides and being supported by these guides. And I would say from a HL7 DaVinci perspective, we've had many conversations and I think that there's a few community members that are actually looking at leveraging the guide for concurrent review. I think we previously fielded the question from the CMS team, so if I'm not putting you on the spot, Lorraine and Alex about whether or not concurrent review is considered in scope um, under the prior author re regula regulations as intended when you guys issued um, these policies. I think that that would be a good clarification, I think, for this audience. So, so uh, is, is concurrent review prior off, basically uh, covered under prior off? So we did not specifically address that in the rule, and I would say that that is um, something that needs to be determined as part of the work workflow within the organization. If this is something that would be prior auth, that if uh, if it would require a prior authorization, then yes, it would be included. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And then um, I think that there's a um, there's a sort of an open ended question around aligning um, timeframes for EPA since they're state activities. Um, I think that um, maybe just some clarification on your timeframes, um, you know, irrespective of what's happening at uh, the state level. Yeah. When when we 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 did address this in the rule, and we, and if there are shorter time frames, then the shorter time frames, you know, can and should be honored. And so I don't know that if the person has a specific question, <clears throat> or you know, to, or wants to provide us with the state information, that that would be fine. But there is language in the preamble, uh, and in the regulation text related to shorter time frames that some states may have. Uh, and there's a couple couple questions. Sorry, generally, oh, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I, and and generally, you know what what is discussed in the rule is that you would follow whichever is the shorter time frame. Right. So if the state, you know, for example, since we um, finalized in our policy that it's 72 hours for expedited requests and seven days for standard requests, if a state requires you know, 24 hours and five days or something, I'm making this up, don't don't quote me on anything, but you know, for example, if that's the time frame that the state requires, you would have to meet the state requirement. Um, so the next uh, question, and there's a few different variations of this in the chat, uh, we'll make sure you get the, the detailed question that's asked after the fact, is, you know, really, I think this idea from a um, implementing and going to scale perspective, people understanding managing endpoint um, management for discovery of different endpoints and and really, you know, if CMS and ONC um, are going to be involved in and helping to solve or um, are there are there should people be expecting um, more from you guys on endpoint discovery? Um, so I um, must channel my inner Mickey Trapathy to highlight <laughs> that if you are participating in TEFCA, TEFCA does have um, an endpoint directory. And so members uh, or participants in TEFCA would have access to that endpoint directory. Um, for those who are not participating in TEFCA, um, 
and you know, of course, still need access to this information. CMS is working on a solution that would be implemented prior to the requirements in this rule um, compliance dates um, that would make payer endpoints available uh, publicly through a CMS hosted system. That's actually that is there is also some um, some discussion of that in the rule as well. So just just to highlight all the fun facts that you can find, um, I think that's in the background. <laughs> so right up when you get into the deep right reading, right? right. Um, <laughs> you have all your spare time to read the eight hundred pages. I think that this is a question that we've been fielding a lot. I think since the rule dropped last week, uh, and Alex and Lorraine, why don't you guys take a pass at it, and I can make a Da Vinci statement around it, which is, um, you know, if we look at the final rule, it's calling out USCDI version three to be enforced by one one twenty seven. But today, um, you're reflecting USCDI version one, US core 3.1.1. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the versioning um, sort of implications uh, in your thought around that? And then I can speak from a DaVinci perspective about what our plans are. Would you like me to tackle that, Lorraine, or would you? Um, well, yes, because it's the standards version advancement. So, well, there. There are two scenarios, I think, that Jocelyn just described, and perhaps in the question as well, right? I'll, I'll do the first one with USCDI and then turn to you for the standard version advancement for the rest. Um, for USCDI, we did uh, the way that it's framed in the rule and the way that it's outlined is that we do say that currently version one, um, and then we point to the ONC regulations for the updated version. So with USCDI specifically, whatever ONC adopts, that is what is also required for our rule. For the other standards, um, because just because of a way of framing um, in the rule, we did adopt specific versions. So our rule adopted versions that mostly aligned with ONC until ONC uh, finalized their HTI one rule, which adopted uh, or yeah adopt, adopted some updated versions of the standards. And that's where and so I'm going to turn it to Lorraine to talk about the standards version advancement process that does actually still allow you to align um, and still meet the requirements of the rule. Right. And we, and again, we hate to keep pointing to the rule, except we have to keep pointing to the rule because that's where the policy descriptions align. And we, and we understand we need to do some additional um, narrative and guidance on this and some more explanation. But when ONC adopts updated versions, the whole purpose of us being able to use and not uh, uh, recommending certain implementation guides was to enable industry to use those updated versions. And in part that aligns with the standards version advancement, when ONC declares a version to be ready for use, it can be used voluntarily until it is adopted officially by regulation. And similarly with the implementation guides, they're recommended to enable industry to continue to use an updated version um, so that we allow for flexibility and don't constrain the use of those. And so that's partly why we're you know, partnering with ONC on the updates, on the standards version advancement, and on recommending versus requiring at this time to enable the use and the flexibility as these, as these move along in their development. And I would add in from the um, DaVinci perspective, one of the things that we're looking at now that HGI1 has become a reality and a final rule and we have sort of a you know a, a new floor to be targeting. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, is happening is just basic information around understanding what the gap is between the current IDs and the next version of USCDI um, that we're targeting, as well as there's a larger conversation happening within the FIRE community, and DaVinci is hoping to help drive sort of that footprint forward of how do we move people from one version to the next while we're in an STU and not in a normative format. So um, if you're not participating either at HL7 or in the DaVinci work groups, I would recommend getting involved there to be part of that discussion. But I think the goal is here, as you heard Lorraine and um, Alex, I think speak to um, very, very eloquently is you know that we really want to make sure that we're not pinning anyone artificially to a floor, but there are understanding that people are gonna be able to advance faster um, than others. So making sure that we can uh, we can handle that gracefully as we move to more modern technologies that we're using inside the industry. And with that, we have a ton more questions. Um, Alex uh, and I will work to make sure, Alex Goss and I will make sure to um, make sure that they are all captured and pulled into our DaVinci conversations. And as I mentioned earlier, we will share your specific questions with the CMS team um, uh, uh, to ensure that they get them. But uh, like um, Alex, Muggy, and Lorraine have um, encouraged you, uh, please participate and make sure that you are getting questions directly to CMS 
um, because, you know, as we've seen over the last four years, you know, they are highly responsible and res responsive and listening to all of the clarifying questions that we're asking. Um, and uh, and we appreciate that. Thank you guys so much for being there. And I'm gonna hand it back to Alex Scott to move to our CDEC um, presentation. Well, thank you. And I uh, look forward to bringing you more information and helping the uh, overall community uh, implement this regulation as we all have learned over the years that uh, interoperability is very much a team sport. So the next presentation, I wanna give a moment of uh, sort of a setup uh, to the Clinical Data Exchange or CDEX conversation. This HL7 Da Vinci Implementation Guide provides detailed guidance, CDEX, uh, that helps implementers use fire-based interactions to support specific clinical data exchanges between providers and payers or other providers. Uh, the Implementation Guide or IG documents direct query, task-based and attachment transaction approaches for requesting and sending information. This is, I think, is a great follow-on to uh, the interoperability overview from 0057 from Alex and Lorraine in that CDEX can actually help us as we move forward uh, with clinical payload exchanges. The key scenarios of this implementation guide can support things like requesting and sending attachments for claims and prior auth, requesting documentation to support payer operations, such as claims audits, gathering information for quality programs, as you're about to hear from Providence, and risk adjustments between payers and providers. It can also help with exchanging clinical da data between referring providers. So in the context of this guide, clinical data means any information a provider holds in a, in a patient's health record. The format of that data exchange is not limited to fire resources, but includes CCDA documents, PDFs, text files, and other types of data. In addition to the capability of, ex of transporting multiple payloads, um, you can also uh, use it to uh, for requesting fire resources and other clinical documents uh, and fire bundles. So the anticipated benefit of using FHIR is more efficient and effective exchange of health record information in several areas like claims management, care coordination, risk adjustment, and quality reporting. And I wanted you to have that broader view as we think about the interoperability landscape we just heard about and the transformation we'll be going through uh, in adopting the new policies by 2026 and using the implementation guides in the APIs by 2027, that CDEX is going to become a part of our future as well. And with that, I would like to invite uh, Michael Westover and uh, Samira to uh, join us. And I'm going to hopefully more smoothly advance your slides. Take it Thank away, Michael. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, well, I'm glad to be talking to you today with uh, Samira Singh, my colleague. And today we're going to be talking about a business problem that Providence, um, the large health system on the West Coast had, how we address that problem using fire and healthcare interoperability. And we're also going to touch a little on the financial impact that that had on our organization. Um, so when it comes to value-based care, uh, population health for large health systems, it's very important that we can exchange um, clinical data with health plans. And so um, they need information beyond what's typically um, in the provider billing data, what, what happens as a part of the billing process when patients go in for care. Um, and they get this supplemental clinical data through various means. Um, the health plans can do chart pulls, so they can reach in and pull an individual patient's chart uh, for a specific visit. They can um, look at EMR or other vendor type platforms like Epic Pair platform um, that's coming into the market. Um, they can, um, the health plans can do uh, annual wellness visits where they will send a caregiver to a member's home or something like that, where they will um, e extract some clinical data uh, during a part of that, that clinical visit. Um, they can get the data from lab companies. Um, but today we're going to be talking about supplemental clinical data for, um, from providers. So from Providence in this case, um, going to payers, um, why that matters, the problems that we've had with this and what we can do. And these are all of the ways that um, health plans can receive data. I know they're healthcare registries and other ways that they can. Um, this is just, these are just a few of the common ways and we're focusing on the supplemental clinical data uh, from the providers to the payers. Next slide. Um, so 
why the provider billing data process is insufficient. So when it comes to adjudicated claims data, um, that's not enough for the health plans for various reasons. We do not expect that it will have everything um, that the health plans will need in the in the short term. Um, so providing uh, provider billing data that goes out um, to the health plans, it's often missing some clinical data elements like you know, blood sugar values uh, for a patient. Also, some codes are dropped as a part of the billing process. Um, for example, let's say there are 40 codes that are generated as part of a visit in an inpatient stay, but maybe there was only room for a smaller number of those codes to be sent out, or maybe it was dropped as part of the data processing, or it could be that a code uh, that something was rejected and then resubmitted and just lost along the way. Um, and also, um, some clinical data has a long look back period where um, the payer might or the health plan might only have access to a year or two of data, but because a patient has been seeing an individual provider for a decade or longer, that we can go back and get clinical data with a longer look back period. So when you take um, all of the, the clinical data and the claims data and the drop code and you know other data sources, the health plans add all that up um, to get the um, the the picture of the risk profile of members and how those patients are doing. And they use that information for clinical care. They use it to make sure that the, that they've identified all of the risks that a patient has so that they can um, treat those. Um, and it's very important as a part of the billing and payment process as well. Next slide. Um, so sub, um, a little more about supplemental clinical data. It includes all of the information on um, healthcare services, lab results, vital signs that are un that may be unavailable through the provider billing process. And um, you can see an example of what it looks like or on the right-hand side um, when that data is delivered using CDEX. Um, and this data will help the health plans perform better on HEDIS measures and five-star measures, which are very, very important financially. Um, to the payers and where we have a risk arrangement in place, a value-based care risk arrangement where we're jointly taking care of a risk population. Um, the payers and provider groups like Providence will come together to do better on five-star measures and making sure we're coding people, ac coding people accurately. It can also support care management and transitions of care. Um, so the health plans and the providers like Providence, we both do some care management and transition functions for the patient populations. And it's very important that we have a similar understanding of our patient's risk profile and the disease states and chronic conditions. And the closer we are to sh a shared understanding, the better we can jointly um, care for those populations. A uh, quick plug here. We always talk about burden reduction, right? And one of the areas that does increase burden for providers is not having enough or adequate information to ensure that all the gaps are closed for their members. And the same thing for payers, right? If you're doing your individual outreach because you don't know that that data exists, this should help alleviate a lot of that. Yeah, and, and one more comment on that shared understanding. I mean, when a provider um, reaches out and tries to schedule a visit, visit with a patient who's already had a thing done, and it's something that the health plan knew, and when the health plan reaches out to a patient and tries to schedule something, that the provider already knew, that's very frustrating to folks on the front lines. It's very frustrating to patients. So being able to efficiently share data is very, very important. I mean, what is this is a foundational thing to be successful in value-based care. Next slide. Um, so how, how do health plans ingest clinical data? Um, there are various ways that it ha happens. This likely isn't all of them. Uh, but here's some of the important ways that um, health plans are ingesting clinical data out, outside of the billing process. Um, so why don't I start with the non-standard flat files? Um, so we're going to be talking about how Providence does this, but we generate data using a combination of the eligibility information that comes from the, from the health plans that list which members belong in the population and we'll generate the we'll put the clinical data in a flat file and send that out. We'll talk more about that. There can be EMR patient charts that are pulled by the health plan. So you imagine a PDF document that has a patient's chart and then the health plan will kind of comb through that data and pull out rele relevant clinical information. That's not as efficient as we would love it to be. It takes an, an enormous amount of energy for people on the front lines to collate this data, get it out to the payers. Um, then we have their entry portals, data entry portals that the health plans manage, where somebody from the provide um, from the provider health system like Providence will log on to this web portal, look at the EMR, and then key information into 
um, this web application, which is incredibly inefficient, um, takes a huge amount of time, um, large amount of resources and is inefficient. Now, there are also EMR and vendor platforms that are coming out where um, they, an Epic pair platform is one example, but there are other examples that, that, that health plans manage and that other EMRs manage uh, where they will facilitate the data exchange with payers through, through platforms that they offer. And then the one that we're excited about and talking about today is I'm using CDEX, Fire, um, I think D DQM mm -hmm. and other IGs to exchange this clinical data in a more efficient way to create a curated data, um, data standard. Um, maybe next slide. Now, this is how we used to um, deliver supplemental clinical data. And the truth is we still deliver data in this way, but we're starting to shift to more of a fire view. Um, so how we used to um, share clinical data is that if you look on the right-hand side, think of a, a flat file with a lot of columns and one record per member. And we would send or one record per member with different clinical information for that member. So here's an example of some of the fields that we would send that would have for this fake patient, Tom Cruise, um, the information that would be needed for a health plan to use this clinical data to support it, um, to send it through their HEDIS engine, and to get credit for HEDIS and five stars um, that auditors would have to accept. Now, what we ran into is um, the data that we would send to the um, to our health plans. It was in different. Um, the health plans would request it in different formats beyond our standard format, um, and they would admit because different health plans have different. Um, HEDIS engines, and they have different auditors that have different requirements, they would ask for additional fields outside of the standard format, or they might ask for multiple data files, depending on how that health plan wants to receive data. So instead of having one acceptable standard, we would have many, many standards that we would send, send to the health plans, which is not efficient. Um, and then the health plans on their side, they're getting non-standard data, and they would have to ingest it in different ways too. Um, it would also create this place where we have what we call data standoffs, where the health plan wants to wants to receive the data in one way, uh, Providence wants to produce the data in one standard way, and we would just like glare at each other across the table, right? And we would say, we're really big. You know, we have 51 um, hospitals and, you know, we're across seven states. And they say, well, we're large too. We're a national um, health plan. You should use our data, our, our data source or our, um, our data standard. And then we would have to negotiate back and forth and it would take time for us to implement their data standard. In short, it's just an inefficient system. Um, so the previous, the, this is the previous state of clinical data exchange that we we had about 15 pairs that we did this with for 62 value-based um, care arrangements for those pairs across the, the West Coast. So what would happen is we would take the eligibility data from the health plans and that eligibility data is in non-standard flat file formats we would take the EMR data from our instances of EPIC, we would combine those two, and we would create one clinical data format for Health Plan 1, another cl clinical data format for Health Plan 2, and another clinical data for Health Plan 3, and try to when we would automate that and send those, um, those data files over and post them on some kind of SFTP server managed by the health plan, and they would ingest that data. Um, actually, we ran into some situations where the health plans just let the data sit in those folders and it wasn't used. Um, but this is how our, our old process worked. Um, now, just announced, and um, we at Providence, and um, I know the Premier folks are excited about this too, is we became the first uh, major health system to implement um, the DaVinci Project's clinical data exchange standards for sharing supplemental clinical data um, with our payer partners when it came to when it comes to value-based care. Um, so we partnered with Primera on this very, very closely. And we said, you know, instead of providing in this different standard for you, why don't we just use the uh, the, the HL7 FHIR um, CDEX standard to give you the data set that you need um, to load information into your HEDIS engine. Not, um, and it would be a curated data set with all of the information that you need um, for quality measures and no additional information and um, theoretically everything that you need to get past an audit and supplement the data that you have so that Providence doesn't have to go on to and click information into one-off websites and use those other methods for exchanging data. Um, and we, they, the primary use case for the CDEX data exchange was to help with CDEX and Five Star. 
Um, and I know the, the question came, um, it's a common question of why, why do we choose CDEX and not DQM or other Da Vinci, other Da Vinci standards? And I think what we would say is that we're very excited about DEQM. Um, that's definitely the direction that we're going. But right now where our partners are um, is that they would like to receive the clinical data that they need to load in their HEDIS engines. And CDEX is a, a lighter touch way to do that. Uh, but we are going to be working with those partners and um, growing and getting to the point where they're ready to accept the DEQM data and the DEQM format. And so we, this is an evolutionary process that we're engaging, uh, but CDEX is meet, can meet the need right now. I, just a, to that. Yeah. I do, you know me all too well. <laughs> uh -huh. um, just a few comments on this though, because I think um, one of the questions that I would have listening to this is I would say, well, why all of the clinical data, right? And Michael, you highlighted on this. Currently, the way that the supplemental data exchange ecosystem works is that providers typically data mine to include information um, according to the HEDIS value sets, right? We take into account the look back period, the patient population, um, exclusions, the characteristics that essentially put the patient in the denominator and so forth. And so we do all of that beforehand. On a yearly basis, we look at the new value sets, look at the definitions, so one of the prior slides said HBD for A1C. We're very um, aware that in 2024, it's now a GSD measure and it has some changes. So we, we don't take this very lightly. We're not just saying, well, there's some clinical data. We're going to pass that on to our peers. We want to, you know, we hope that closes gaps. We are essentially saying we are taking into account the member population that you have given us via ATR. We are looking at those members, determining which of those members qualify for those specific measures. And then we're going off and looking at our clinical data sources to ensure that we can supply the proper SOMID codes, blank codes, CPT, whatever it may be, that would essentially ensure gap closure or that would remove that patient from that denominator based off of their um, uh, you know, health history and so forth. And so, as Michael said, we're very excited about the EQM, but we also don't want to build something and not have any partners who are willing to come play with us. Um, and so instead we said, okay, our pair partners need clinical data. How do we give them the clinical data that they need in a format that if they go to, to the next provider who has higher capabilities, they'll get the same kind of information with the same kind of profile and so forth to be able to ingest this data and make it actionable. Mm -hmm. Yep. And rapid deployment. And also it, it often takes um, health plans or payers um, months to ingest this type of data. And we want to get to the point where the data is clean. It is um, easy to ingest. It is curated and they can ingest it quickly into their system so that they, instead of taking months, um, we can have a similar view of what our patient's health history looks like. And we can be um, acting much more efficiently and doing much better on our risk arrangements. Okay, and I think we can go to the next slide. All right, so what, cl what clinical data are we delivering using CDEX? Um, so you can see that in production, we have about, um, in the clinical data associated with about 12 um, quality measures. These are quality measures that are heavy hitters for our risk arrangements where our pair partners have come to us and said, we want to focus on breast cancer screening, for example, and blood pressure control for patients with diabetes, right? And these are very important for our risk contracts where kind of Providence is um, jointly incentivized with the payer to, where we're working together for this patient population to do as well as we can on these screenings. And if we do um, reduce the total cost of care and improve the measurable quality by working on these measures that we kind of both share in the savings and um, and the patients are healthier and happier and everybody wins in this case. Um, we're also um, working on developing a few additional measures um, this, I mean, in the next month or two. And then we're trying to produce as many of the HEDIS measures as makes sense and that are relevant by the end of 2024. So any HEDIS measures, all of the clinical measures that are related to Five Star, we're working very hard on getting those available to expose via CDEX um, this year. Um, now, why why payers can trust supplemental clinical data? Um, so health plans are willing to use the supplemental clinical data for HEDIS and five-star measures because um, when, when we begin sharing data with them, we share test data and we agree on the formats and that we're going to be using um, CDEX and here are the, you know, the, you know, they're the must-have fields and the may-have fields. Like we're agreeing on what data needs to be exchanged as a part of um, CDEX. 
we share a few sample patient charts from the EMR and um, the, the payers and the auditors can look at those and see that the data from the EMR and the PDF documents of a patient chart matches the clinical information that we're sharing via, via CDEX and they can trust that. Um, health plans can establish provenance for the data because this information is coming directly from the EMR. Um, they can trust it. Uh, we provide data dictionaries and descriptions on how to use the data. And we also have a history of passing audits with the health plans over the years. And so there's that trust that we've established with the health plans and their um, HEDIS auditors. Um, and I think it's very exciting to us that um, that we implemented with, um, with Primera in, um, I think it was August. And then a couple months later, their, their auditors looked at it and said, yes, we can use this for HEDIS. Um, so this auditable, usable data. Um, and we didn't send out our, our press release saying that we did this until we knew that the data was usable um, by the health plans and by their auditors. Um, so a few of the improvements that we're making on our supplemental clinical data for 2024, in addition to talking about creating more of the HEDIS, me the, the HEDIS measure set, um, at least those that are um, clinically relevant where you need supplemental clinical data out of the EMR, and we're adding more data elements to support new measures. We're also supporting, um, we also have the ability to support broader populations. So if we can get um, a outside of the value-based care arrangement, so maybe a payer says, I want to get all of the data um, not just for value-based care, but for my entire patient, my member panel, um, we could do we could do that for them. And we're also looking at um, right now. Um, we are doing kind of a we have a bulk. We're sharing data in bulk for the value-based care populations, but we're building the the technology to do individual patient queries where you just want to look at individual data for one patient uh, for one moment, as opposed to the entire bulk. Uh, process, which we feel like will be import important for clinical care and for going after targeted um, lists of patients to improve their um, clinical performance. Uh, now, we're, we wanted to, to finish the discussion before we get to some questions, and I see there's some great questions um, that are coming through in the chat um, or in the QA section, is that um, why the supplemental clinical data matters on a financial basis to the organization. So we can give you a success example here in the green and a failure example in the blue. Um, so we have a large Medicaid contract that has roughly 90,000 members. And near in a 2022 submission deadline, um, we, we submitted an additional six patients um, through supplemental clinical exchange. And that the submitting clinical data for those six patients allowed Providence to earn an additional $2 million dollars. <laughs> on what was an $8 million incentive program, but became a $10 million incentive program, right? So instead of making $8 million on a risk arrangement, Providence made $10 million on that risk arrangement because of six patients, right? And then there's another one on the right where we were two patients away from moving from 4.5 stars to five stars uh, for a population, which would have helped a large amount with contract negotiations with that um, health plan, um, quality bonuses and incentives that Providence receives for that work. Um, so it was two patients away from being a massive win for Providence and for our health plan partner. And if you think of Providence where we have you know roughly 200 risk arrangements, these are just two examples, but multiply this by um, you know, 100, 200 um, risk arrangements. Uh, with over a million lives and lar a large number of members that, uh, um, that we're taking care of here, um, where this can be a large, there's a large financial incentive to do this work. And so it's very important like from my perspective, and I'll tell this to anyone who will listen, that um, we should not wait around to have um, some fire and interoperability foisted upon us. There are very good business reasons to do fire, CDEX, ATR, um, DEQM and you know, other business cases um, that are covered by fire right now outside of um, having a mandate um, thrust upon us. And this is one good example of um, clinical, clinical data exchange where we do see that there's a strong financial incentive and patient care exam incentive and a health plan incentive like and um, CMS wants us to do better at exchanging this type of data. Like the, the stars are aligned. Everyone wants to be able to exchange this data efficiently. Everyone benefits all the way down the, the line. It's also worth noting, if anyone is sitting there wondering how are six patients worth $2 million, this was a quality gated contracts, yeah. contract and we needed the six patients to push us beyond the gate so that we can um, 
uh, enjoying those shared savings, right? Generated yes. through other program initiatives. Yeah. Um, think about think about if you have a thousand patients, right? That you've that you've done all the work of bringing them in and making sure you're managing their blood sugar levels, and then, but if you could just bring in two more, or and actually those two more actually came in and had the care. We just needed to send the, get the clinical data to the health plan so that we could be recognized for those one thousand two. 1,000 and two uh, patients. That qualify. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions in that, I'm looking forward to talking about a few of these on the, in the QA, um, Q and A, but um, Samir Singh, um, and you have her contact information at Providence and her LinkedIn profile. And then mine, if you have any um, questions or would like to understand this at a, at a deeper level or brainstorm with us, we, um, we we love to make connections. I think there's some quotes that we could pull from today's presentation. You guys really helped bring home the value proposition. We don't need regs. We have the right incentives already in place uh, today in our business models to help us with picking up and using standards that are available. And we can um, collaborate on making them stronger um, while we're also de uh, developing those. Uh, so I love that you don't need to wait around. I love that quote. And um, the, the best API IG they can be uh, from Lorraine. So it's it's really great to see how the community is working together to really advance um, value-based care. And uh, I think that's really an important uh, collaborative effort. And Jocelyn, I wanna take a, a moment and see what uh, questions we have uh, yeah. for the conference team. It's the chatter is great. Uh, and people are definitely leaning in and listening to what you guys are saying, which I think is fantastic. I'd say um, we had a couple passes at sort of the overlap of where we're headed with TESCA and leveraging networks and where you guys see that versus the point-to-point -point work you're doing with, you know, your strategic partners in your local market. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want I, me to take, go ahead. I'd like to go for it. <laughs> we're, we're both excited. No, 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 please go ahead. I'll add on. <laughs> okay, oh. I'll go. So, so. There's a lag. Um, okay, I'm going to so, come on you next time. <laughs> Samira, why don't you go first? <laughs> perfect, perfect. So we we clearly recognize the importance of TESCA or the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreements. When we started this work, uh, QHINs were not live. Right. We anticipated that this is the direction that everything would move in. And so, like Michael mentioned, um, we didn't want to wait for regulation to hit or for something else to be formed prior to implementing use cases that we know will be um, major as it pertains to you know, financial incentives, as well as burden reduction, um, manual processes, and so forth. And so um, that's part one. But part two, there was a question, I think, around how does this fit in within TESCA, and can, can this work essentially be incorporated into um, that network uh, process. And it absolutely can. And if you all are interested, if you look at the work that eHealth Exchange is doing as a Cuban, I'm sure many others as well, um, they're essentially looking at use cases like CDEX, like prior authorization and so forth. And they're bringing payers and providers and vendors and so forth to the table to say, how do we leverage the standards throughout this process while eHealth Exchange is providing the pipes? right, as a QHIN, um, to ensure that scalability is a reality for us, right? Instead of those point-to-point -point connections, you essentially have this vast network of participants who are who have the same uh, essentially thought process as you as it pertains to clinical data exchange, whether that be for, you know, treatment right now and payment and operations down the road. Um, but this process could absolutely fit within that. And I think clinical data exchange on its own is powerful. I think if you look at the development of DQM and, you know, the HEDIS IG and, and the future and so forth, and putting those constraints on the actual data that you need um, and making it work for your, your use cases, I think that is going to be absolutely phenomenal. And it will take away the complications from these point-to-point -point conversations, individual data element discussions and so forth, once we have that scalability in place through um, hopefully TESCA, right? Yeah, so we're um, we're very interested in, in Tefka and like very supportive of the kind of the vision behind it. Um, we're also talking to um, collaboratives um, in in our markets where we can think about how to scale together and grow together. Um, so there's there's a lot of work there. Um, I also want to mention that we're it's not just Primera. Um, we're talking to other um, health plans, um, and when we when we show them this, they 
they every every it seems like every health plan we've spoken to has been very interested in talking to us about this. And as soon as we show them um, the clinical data that we can provide for their value based care population, it immediately turns into this is fantastic. Like, how can I get more of this type of data for more lives and for more um, use cases? I think that's great, and I I think that that shows the power too of getting beyond that first use case. Um, we did have uh, one anonymous question that came in around sort of why we're looking at such small sample sizes for a lot of the storytelling that we're doing out in market. And I would just maybe um, maybe sort of um, caution us around thinking that there really are small sample sizes. People are getting their fire program started, right? And often uh, we see organizations that don't move until there's regulatory movement. But um, I would say from a PMO perspective, right? Alex and myself and Leslie work across the DaVinci community today. And I think that there are many more examples out there. I think I wanna say thank you to both the Providence team and teams like Cambia and MultiCare that have been in previous um, community forums and the Evernorth Evercore team has come and spoken about their progress um, around prior authorization as well, that it is very rare to have people talking sort of pre-production or just post-production publicly about their development programs. And I think that's really important for us to recognize, I'd say the um, braveness and boldness of these people that are putting sort of the time at, in their day, not just getting their work done, but coming back and evangelizing, sort of come along, the water's warm to everyone else. So I just wanna, I wanna put a, a fine point on that. And I think that the, um, and I think you'll continue, especially as we gear up to hymns, I think to hear more and more people talking publicly about their successes. But it dovetails, I think, with two other questions that were in there, um, that were in the chat today. And, and one of them was, um, about and I don't want to put you guys on the spot, so we can do follow up to the community if if you don't if you're not comfortable um, answering this question. But just was really um, you know maybe just a starting framework to think about what was the duration of time cost um, for you to actually do this CDEX implementation and your other fire implementations because I think that that is always refreshing information to hear. Yeah, I'll, I'll let. Samira handled a question about time and costs. I mean, she's definitely in the in the thick of things. Um, but before we go to that question, I mean, about the size, I know we've started with Primera and we're kind of working with the uh, um, other pairs, but we would love for it to be a million lives um, our, and, you know, 10 pairs all across the West Coast and national pairs. I mean, we would love um, to start expanding getting to that point. So um, Thank you. it's definitely a journey. AKA, please reach out to us. <laughs> we would like to scale out and up and share all of our lessons learned. Um, the more payers and providers and vendors that implement this, the better off all of us are, right? Um, so as it pertains to time and uh, costs, so I, I do think that may have come from someone who was, oh, it wasn't anonymous. Please feel free to reach out as well afterwards. I won't go into too much detail here, but there are specific things to consider, right? Are you going to build or buy? Are you going to have fire engineers on your team? Are you going to hire um, a team of experts to do this? Are you going to have a fire server such as Smile or build your own? Um, what kind of hosted environment do you have in the cloud? What are the components there? How do you handle security and so forth? So um, for us, when we tackle this, we kind of, we, we did two things in parallel. We started with uh, member attribution, which if you have a value-based care contract, the most important thing um, besides the contractual terms, of course, and the duration and all of that stuff is who are your members? And so we wanted to make sure that we could also move away from, you know, the hundreds of formats that we're getting as it pertains to member data and to a standard uh, exchange, so we implemented ATR, um, and uh, in parallel, we were also working on CDEX. We were doing our data mining, looking at whether the data would be available to us through the G10 APIs or through our Clarity backend data warehouses, whether we had to do any mapping um, and all of that stuff, plus the approval through our uh, information security teams as it pertains to our architectural diagram, uh, testing, leakage, there's a lot that goes into it. So the first time that we implemented these two use cases in parallel, it did take us a while. It took us, I want to say about a year and a half at least, um, with testing, going back and forth, validating against the implementation guide, as well as internal um, data requirements and accounting for any extensions as well. Um, but once you implement this once, it's a lot faster, right? As Michael mentioned, we have our secondary and tertiary pairs that we're currently working with. Yes, there's still a little bit of back and forth because contracts can differ when it comes to value-based care, um, but it's not that same, um, you know, build, infrastructure, validation uh, requirements 
anymore. So we're anticipating that the first implementation took a while. The second will be a bit more plug and play. The third, we will be professionals and, and so forth. So, um, yeah. you know, without divulging any specific costs, there are things that you, you do have to take into account. So if you are interested in this or you're just starting and um, you would like some guidance, please feel free to reach out. We're absolutely happy to talk about this in detail. Yeah. And um, my my understanding is that the um, where most of the time is, is on the information security component, because we're talking about patient data here and getting that right is very, very important. I think there's two two takeaways there, I think, that are important. I think the ability to be able to leverage TEFCA and the framework and the common agreement, I think, will be really important in sort of lowering that barrier, right, for people that are coming along. But I yeah. think that that reusability, and I, Samira, I always just love that you answer questions before I can ask you them. Um, the reusability component here, not just for CDAC, um, for this particular use case, but maybe could you speak a little bit to the reuse of this use case um, to, for other purposes or other ways that you imagine that you might use CDAC and then comma, yes. um, the ability to stand up other use cases and other workflows? Yes, I love that question. Okay, <laughs> um, as it pertains to CDEX and other use cases, something that we are looking at is risk adjustment, right? In the legacy world, most providers send ASM files um, for much the same reason that Michael talked about as it pertains to uh, uh, capturing that comprehensive risk profile for the patient and making sure that both the payer and provider are on, um, are on the same page as to you know how healthy or sick or whatever it may be, their populations are and, and initiatives and all that stuff. But um, one of the things that we're looking at right now is, is there a way that we can recycle some of the work that we've done through CDEX for quality gap closure for the risk adjustment use case? We know that there is a risk adjustment IG. And we would absolutely love to get to that point as well. But given that we have patient practitioner, practitioner role, observation, uh, procedure, I think we're testing immunization and so forth within our uh, ecosystem right now. And we're familiar with those resources. Um, how can we take that, recycle it and ensure that our payer partners are still getting the data that they need to capture risk adequately? So there's one piece of reusability. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, and, and just adding to that, also, I know that Samir has talked a little bit about this, but the reusability of all of the infrastructure that we've created with Samir. Right is just going to make it so much faster. I mean, the idea is that um, there's of course going to be a little bit of testing to make sure everything's flowing nicely um, and that their security model works, but um, it should be relatively rapid to get each additional partner on. So I do have one more technical question that I'm gonna throw at you guys, and then I'm gonna give it back to Alex um, to see if we've got any other questions that we wanna wrap up before we wrap up for today. But um, the technical question was uh, just with your actual uh, implementation of CDEX, did you use direct query task space or attachments um, from a, um, just from a transaction pers perspective? For the primary implementation, we did not. I believe okay. Michael touched on this. Um, so when you have a value-based care contract that has 60,000 or more members in it, um, uh, direct query one our pairs were not ready for that yet right they right. weren't ready to tap into our, our um repository and say for samira saying give me these codes because it's going to suffice for this and so what we said is we know that we need to share this data we know that it benefits both the payer and provider and the patient um how do we do that in a way where we can pre-process it ensure that the pairs are going to get what they need to be able to close gaps and that our providers are not having to do you know outreach and additional things so we we essentially Yes, we're using uh, CDEX and US core profiles and everything else, but we are leveraging the bulk framework because we want to ensure, especially at the start of the year, that we can close mm -hmm. as many of those gaps as possible, especially within our commercial or Medicaid populations where patients might be changing plans and payers don't have access to the same kind of information right away. Um, but the task-based query is really important. For those of you that were talking about TEFCA earlier, um, I encourage you to look into that a little bit more. Um, and so that is something that we are you know, considering and thinking about. And then the direct query as well. We would love to support that, especially because at the end of the year, as of Michael's financial example, there's always a few patients, Amazing. right? Yeah. Right. And we'd love to be able to create a better pathway for uh, peer partners to come in and say, you know, for Michael Westover, I need the specific data set, and then we can validate validate against ATR and um, some other components to make sure that that payer should have access to that data within that look back period, you know, and so forth, and then make that available in a timely manner. And I just, Alex, before I hand it back to you, I think maybe just not to put too fine a point on it, but I think both Michael and Samira talked about 
sort of starting here with CDEX, but understanding we want to get to the EQM. Do you guys have any sort of opinion or thoughts about what is that tipping point of when soon becomes today and that this is the way that we're implementing um, or what we could be doing as a community to really leverage our investment in DEQM sooner rather than later? I, I want Michael to answer this as well. Yeah. Oh, maybe you go first. I, I've been talking too much. I mean, my, my sense is that <laughs> when we have peer partners that say we want DEQM, like we're ready to catch it, um, like we're ready for it. Uh, we would love to partner um, with health health plans um, that are interested in doing that work. Okay, I think I have some folks I'm going to send your way. And with that, Alex, you can have it back. Well, thank you, Justin. Appreciate your help uh, with uh, the Q and A today. There was a, a couple questions that I wanted to just kind of bundle up here that I think are, are one is is probably fairly quick and the other one, not so much. Um, so there was a question about your risk adjustment uh, comment about going in that direction. Um, are you talking primarily about a Medicare Advantage uh, arrangement for that? I, I can talk to that. So when it comes to risk adjustment, people commonly think of Medicare Advantage and that's definitely true. Um, but when it comes to um, any type of risk arrangement that is risk adjusted, so meaning there's some kind of adjustment if making sure that people are coded effectively. So it can absolutely impact Medicaid and commercial contracts as well. Um, not all com not all risk arrangements are risk adjusted. Medicare Advantage certainly are, but most of them are government programs as well. It's pretty rare these days that we have a, a value-based care arrangement that's not risk adjusted. So there's a question around um, the managing and governing the, the access to agreed upon data. And you talked a little bit about the trust aspects with your payers, uh, the, the work that you needed to do with your information security. So it seemed to me really that because this was the first you know, foray into CDEX and really heavy usage of your fire infrastructure, things probably took a little bit more to um, longer to get stood up. And that's why you, know, you think as you go through each of the subsequent um, uh, uh, adding on the health plans is gonna go faster and easier for you. However, is can you speak to any of the aspects related to that minimum necessary aspect? Did you have to negotiate that with the, the, the health plans or is it that you're just giving, because you're doing the data element analysis with them early on, that's how you manage the, the access to the patient information? Or is it just based upon the patient being on an attribution list? That's parts of a question we got from an anonymous attendee. That is a big part of it, right? Um, we are sharing data for patients that are under our risk-based contracts, value-based care contracts, some sort of agreement where both the payer and provider are responsible for the patient's care. And so um, at ATR is absolutely the starting point for us. We ingest that data, we perform patient matching, we ensure, as I've mentioned, that the patient meets the requirements for that for those specific quality measures that are part of the contract. Um, as it pertains to the actual data elements themselves and whether any extensions are required or anything else to meet the measure, we do walk through that process with our payers. Um, we walk through uh, the legacy data that they've historically received for quality gap closure, as Michael mentioned, is in our proprietary providence format, um, to how that information is uh, represented within fire resources, the data elements and so forth. And so we make sure that there is consensus before we go into any sort of um, testing or you know, product development process with their peers to ensure that they are in fact getting the information that they need um, to be able to close those gaps. And what we find, and I don't know that this is necessarily true for every single HEDIS measure. We obviously, as you all saw, have not built all of them, although it would be nice one day to have everything. Um, but what we find is that the data that is available to us, and that is you know, a must support or should or may or whatever the categories may be within the actual resource itself, is more than enough than what is required for the actual measure itself. For example, there are quite a few really measures. What the fire implementation guide supports is far greater than what the, the actual heat is. Or exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You could have a measure that requires the patient demographics, the date the procedure was done, and any you know outcome, right? And that would close the gap. No practitioner is needed, whatever it may be. However, because we are providing the resources uh, uh, around the observation or the procedure or whatever it may be, we will also give you the practitioner because we want to ensure that you're getting what you need. And so we have thus, uh, and we would be happy to hear from others if they have found uh, anything um, 
of the inverse to be true, but thus far we've we found that the FIRE standard is comprehensive enough to close gaps and to give our peers what they need uh, to calculate those quality measures while at the same time not going above and beyond and sharing anything above the minimum necessary that's required for those measures. Yeah, and and to add on top of that, um, the approach that we've taken is, I mean, when you look at CDEX by itself, if you wanted to build out every single part of CDEX, it's a lot, right? But if we look at a, this specific use case where it will help patients and there's a strong financial case for it, we can deliver what is needed to get through that audit and to contribute to the, the HEDIS calculations and five-star measures. If we can deliver just that thing, we have a strong business case and we can provide a curated data set you know, that, that uses the, the measure sets, um, that we can do something really strong and helpful. And we kind of like that business case perspective of delivering these types of products. It really sounds like you've invested in a model that you're going to be able to evolve and continue to pace with industry on and with your business partners, your trading partners, uh, your health plans, um, and really also comes back to the data that gets captured inside your electronic health record uh, in your, your care delivery models. And do you have any commentary like on the operational workflow end of things? Have you learned, you know, it's one thing. To, to know that, that your EHR can hold the data. It's another thing to make sure that the data gets in there. So has there been an operational, like boots on the ground care delivery, like feedback loop out of learning out of all this? There has, especially with labs, <laughs> because so, many, so much of the lab work is done externally, right? And so the way that that data is reconciled internally through what process, um, whether it's represented as a code or some internal, um, proprietary code, as was customary historically and so forth. Um, that has taught us a lot. And it has taught us that our Epic partners internally, um, our providers and so forth are such important partners. Because as you've mentioned, Alex, we could only extract the data that is available to us. And if on one hand, we are saying the state has to adhere to specific standards to be able to close gaps, but we're not representing it as such, um, that is definitely a hurdle. And so this isn't anything, you know, and, and I love that you're alluding to this. This isn't anything that a single interoperability team can do on their own. You have to have the right partners from labs to radiology to, you know, the build team and so forth to be able to provide that feedback and to be able to improve together and grow together and get to a point where that data is so liquid that, um, you know, and so up to standard that you can share with any of the partners within your trusted network. And it really uh, speaks to the opportunity of the strategic investment that Providence has made uh, because you're investing in your future and your efficiency. It also enables you, the more efficient you are with your resources, human and financial and technical, the more that your, um, your care teams can take care of patients, which is, this is all about. Uh, and I think this has been a fantastic uh, community roundtable launch for 2024. I'm very grateful for uh, Providence team and their continued uh, commitment, investment, and leadership in the fire space. And for our federal partners, uh, CMS uh, um, Interoperability Group and the health informatics team, uh, really helping to advance uh, the, the policy floor that we can all build on as we realize that this is no longer a... Uh, an opportunity for just compliance. It's around really investing in our models, which are all focused on the human care aspects. And at one point we'll all be a patient uh, as we all probably will uh, be reminded of as we read the preamble of uh, 0057. So with that, I invite everyone uh, to complete the survey at the conclusion um, of this webinar, which we're about to come into, and that to also remind you that uh, there are additional resources on clinical data exchange and uh, that at the in the appendix, as well as some programmatic updates. Uh, so we will see you back on uh, February 28th, I believe, for our next community roundtable. And uh, stay tuned for details on that scope. Thanks and have a great rest of your day.